This is a response to CV's video, Examining Race, Episode 1, Population Genetics. All of my sources and a transcription of the first 28 minutes of CV's video will be linked in a Google document in the description. A number will pop up on the screen, which will correspond to any source that I am citing at that time in the video. Because I have transcribed CV's video, it is very easy for you to determine whether or not I am taking his words out of context. If you were wondering, CV is a transsexual whose preferred pronouns are they, them. But here's my philosophy. I will fucking talk to you any goddamn way I want. So I'll be using the pronouns he or him. Before responding to the content of his video bit by bit, I'll summarize what CV does address in his video. Ancestry testing services such as 23andMe, Ancestry.com, GenCove, etc. Noah Rosenberg's 2002 cluster analysis of human populations, and the medical usage of race with heart disease, sickle cell anemia, and bone marrow transplants. What's remarkably absent from his video are any of the four following points. One, any definition of race presented by a race realist. Two, any comparison of the heterozygosity, meaning genetic variability, within humans as compared to other species with many recognized subspecies. Three, any comparison of the genetic distance between human races and those distances seen between the subspecies of other animals. Four, any comparison of the length of time required for subspeciation in other species relative to the time human populations have spent in geographic isolation from each other. Before I address any of CV's arguments, I'll first build a positive case around the subjects that he failed to address. I'll include a timestamp if you want to skip this part and start right where I respond to CV's arguments. I'll start with defining race, and I'll reference Richard Lynn, Sean Last, and Ryan Falk. Richard Lynn is a professor emeritus of psychology at the University of Ulster, author, and a graduate of King's College at Cambridge. A simple and straightforward definition of race is that it consists of a group that is recognizably different from other groups. A fuller definition is that a race is a breeding population that is to some degree genetically different from neighboring populations as a result of geographical isolation, cultural factors, and endogamy, and which shows observable patterns of genotypic frequency differences for a number of intercorrelated, genetically determined characteristics compared with other breeding populations. Geographical contact zones between races generally contain racial hybrids who show intermediate values of gene frequencies from the more central distributions of the breeding groups. These hybrid and mixed race populations are known as dynes. Sean Last. A race of people is just a geographically defined set of populations which, in the past, if not now, lived together and bred with each other more than they bred with outsiders. Given this definition, it is obvious that races are real because it is obvious that people who descend from Africa, Europe, East Asia, etc. are real. Ryan Falk Races are obviously just populations of people geographically separated that interbred and thus are genetically and physically distinguishable. That's obviously true and all you need, and we should be able to just go forward and talk about the genetic differences between these races. Even if we accept as valid all of CV's criticisms of Rosenberg's 2002 study, is it possible for us to say that there are human groups that are recognizably different from other groups? Yes, obviously, meeting Lynn's simple definition of race. And do races meet the standard of breeding populations somewhat genetically different to other breeding populations? Obviously, yes, when we consider studies such as Tain, 2005. Genetic cluster analysis of the microsatellite markers produced four major clusters which showed near-perfect correspondence with the four self-reported race-ethnicity categories. Of 3,636 subjects of varying race and ethnicity, only 5, or 0.14%, showed genetic cluster membership different from their self-identified race or ethnicity. It is only possible to identify a subject's race this reliably because there are, in fact, genetically distinct breeding populations within the human species.
The ability to sort humans phenotypically with great reliability is sufficient to meet Ernst Meyer's definition of subspecies. Evolutionary biologist Ernst Meyer received the Crawford Prize, which is granted in part by the same Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences that awards the Nobel Prize. Suffice to say that Meyer is an eminent evolutionary biologist. His rule for determining if an isolated breeding population was sufficiently different to designate it as a subspecies is this. In the case of subspecies, it is a good convention that at least 75% of the individuals of one subspecies, or of the available specimens, should be separable on the basis of their diagnostic characters from the specimens of the most similar subspecies. I know that CV has trouble with categorization, given that he can't even identify his own gender, but even he should be able to sort out 75% of examples of Nigerians from, from a mixed sample of Japanese and Nigerian people with at least 99% accuracy. The last point I'll make about defining race is that there are non-arbitrary reasons to divide humans into four, five, or six races instead of 20 or 50. Human memory, intelligence, and patience are all limited, so greater precision is going to come at the cost of comprehensibility and convenience. Before comparing human genetic variability to that of other species, here's a review of some terminology that was used in CV's video and will be used in this video. Instead of reading off all of this terminology for you, I'm going to show the terms on the screen for a few seconds each, and if you want to read them, pause the video. As promised, I'll now compare the genetic variability within humans to that of other species with many recognized subspecies. Genetic diversity is primarily measured by heterozygosity, or differences in microsatellite repeat unit length. CV does not compare human genetic variability in humans to that of other animals except in one unsourced throwaway line about emperor penguins. I have recreated the following table which appears in Michael Woodley's 2009 paper, Is Homo Sapiens Polytypic? Human Taxonomic Diversity and Its Implications. As you can see, humans are more heterozygous than the North American gray wolf, which has 37 recognized subspecies, and we have roughly twice as much genetic variability as the Scandinavian wolverine, which has two or three recognized subspecies. Here is a graph of this data. Pause the video if you want to look at it for a while. I'm moving on. Number three, a comparison of the genetic distance between human races and those distances seen between the subspecies of other animals. Genetic variability within humans is a different concept than genetic distance between human races. Note that genetic distance is synonymous with fixation index or FST values. You don't need to completely understand how fixation index values are calculated in order for you to understand that it is a measure of how frequently an allele differs between two populations, specifically how much more likely an individual within one population is to share an allele from an individual within the same population than with an individual from the entire species as a whole. Lower FST values imply greater similarity and more interbreeding between populations. Higher values imply greater genetic distance and isolation. Richard Lewinton was the first person to claim that low FST values in humans suggest that there cannot be any biological significance to race. An FST value like 0.12 in humans can be stated as 88% of variation occurs within and only 12% between groups. This statement about variation within versus between is known as Lewinton's fallacy, and instead of trying to give you a complex statistical explanation of why this is wrong, I'm presenting you a comparison of FST distances between humans and other animals. If a low FST distance actually precluded biological distinctions between isolated breeding populations, there should not be any species with a lower FST distance than humans, which still has recognized subspecies. You can clearly see that humpback whales, zebras, cob, and European wildcats all have as much or lower FST values and still have recognized subspecies. You should note that in this graph, there is no real correlation with FST value and number of recognized subspecies, which is precisely why it's not a common practice in biology to determine how many subspecies exist within a species or whether they exist at all via calculating FST values. What's also noteworthy is that the genetic distance between the South African Bantu and Australian Aboriginals is so significant at 0.33 that if you arbitrarily demanded that all subspecies have an FST value higher, 
let's say at 0.35, you would be setting forth a requirement that would likely eliminate the category of subspecies entirely. At that point, you would not be arguing with, quote, race scientist, unquote, you would be trying to disprove an entire portion of taxonomy. Another point is that the FST value of 0.12 obtained for humans is an averaging of the between groups FST distance. To quote Lawn 2003, Sewell writes, population structure statistic, FST, measured among samples of world populations is often 15% or less. This would indicate that 85% of genetic variation occurs within populations, while only 15% can be attributed to allele frequency differences among groups. In this paper, we show that this low value reflects strong biases that result from violating hidden assumptions that define FST. In our analyses, Estimates of FST fail to identify important variation. For example, when the analysis includes only humans, FST is calculated at 0.119, but adding the chimpanzees to this calculation increases it only a little to 0.183. So only 18.3% of variation occurs between human and chimpanzees populations, and the majority 81.7% of variation occurs within humans and chimpanzees. If we apply Lewontin's logic to this statistic, this means that there are no real genetic differences between chimpanzees and humans. One family, the hominidae family. Chimpanzees are just like you and I. 81% of variation is within chimpanzees and humans, only a measly 18.3% occurs between us. One race, the human race. Everyone else is just like you, only a measly 12 to 15% of variation occurs between populations. The final major point that CV failed to address is a comparison of the time required for subspeciation in other animals as compared to humans. Many other species have undergone subspeciation in much less time than humans have been outside of Africa. Now I rest my case on the subjects that CV failed to address, and I'll respond to his video from the beginning. Remember that the transcript for his video is in the description. I can't respond to every single sentence, because if I did, this video would be about three hours long. My focus will be to address the most impactful arguments and the most inaccurate claims that he makes. My response to CV's content will be broken up into three main sections. Ancestry testing, cluster analyses, and the medical usefulness of race. To make it easier to understand when I'm quoting CV, and when I am making my own case, I will use a text-to-speech program to read CV's quotes. One of the most ridiculous pet research problems out there that's simply funded too well to die is race science. Nobel Prize winner and co-discoverer of the helical structure of DNA, James Watson, had to resort to selling his Nobel Prize to make ends meet. Why? Because he suggested that Western policies towards African countries are wrongly based on an assumption that black people are as clever as their white counterparts when IQ testing suggests the contrary. Clearly, there were universities scrambling to hire this Nobel Prize winning scientist to head their department of race science, right? The reason why race realist research has such a hold on so many people is because it does validate a lay conception of race, a common sense idea of race that hasn't been around that long but is so deeply entrenched in us that attitudes about it are passed down from parents to children. CV offers absolutely no proof for the claim that racial categorization is a recent phenomenon. The idea of race has, in fact, been around for a long time. The ancient Egyptians made racial distinctions thousands of years ago. But let's consider an excerpt from Vasco da Gama detailing his first voyage in Africa in the last decade of the 15th century. Before I do that, I want to give you a brief comparison of African and European accomplishments by that time. This is 15th century African art. This is 15th century European art. This is a 19th century African warrior. This is the armor of a 15th century European from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. For architecture, this is the King's College Chapel in Cambridge, England, also built in the 15th century. I'd show you an impressive structure built in Sub-Saharan Africa by Sub-Saharan Africans prior to 1500, but there aren't any. No, sorry black Israelites, Egypt does not count. That's right. That's right. If you haven't gathered the point I'm making, given how vastly different European and African societies and people were and still are, any European who made contact with Africans prior to 1800 would not have treated them as equals and would have immediately categorized them as an outgroup. Now here's the passage referring to the messengers sent by a Moorish, meaning Arab, ruler in northern Africa, noting that the apparently Christian messengers seemed almost white. Clearly, 
early Portuguese explorers made racial distinctions without being propagandized into doing so. This journal of de Gamas makes reference to Negroes and even to Negro slaves, but makes little, if any, effort to try to explain why slavery of non-whites would be justified. This is probably because it was taken for granted that Africans were not worthy of the same considerations as civilized Europeans. It's without a doubt that any early Europeans who interacted with sub-Saharan Africans would have immediately noticed a distinction between us and them. The idea that whites would regularly enslave blacks from the late 15th century onwards but were somehow anti-racist until anthropology started to make conceptions of race more universal in the 1800s is ridiculous. The only Europeans who didn't make racial categorizations were the ones who had never interacted with foreign races or even heard of them. The degree to which the concept of race was not universal in Europe around the 1500s and 1600s and even 1700s is only true because of the often limited contact with foreigners and even other Europeans. Johann Blumenbach proposed categorizing humans into five broad racial categories in the 1770s. His diagram is what you've just been seeing on the screen. So it's not as if the concept of race was suddenly invented as soon as slavery was ending in the early to mid 19th century. Ancestry testing services look at specific short regions of DNA, oftentimes small nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Some regions of DNA like the ones that defend us against different strains of the flu mutate much more quickly than others. And so as people move around those nucleotides can give you a sense of what pathogens they interacted with and, by extension, where they are from. I'm going to nitpick on this quote. It's not a small nucleotide polymorphism, it's a single nucleotide polymorphism. But otherwise, that quote's pretty accurate. If across your genome you share many SNPs that are most common in populations that are sampled in modern-day France, you'll likely be assigned at least partial ancestry from Western Europe or France. These tests aren't perfect, and results will vary based on how thoroughly different populations have been sampled. But these tests will only get more accurate as time goes on, and as the reference libraries expand. Note that the majority of people even getting these ancestry tests are European, so in practical terms, it isn't that big of a shortcoming if populations from Papua New Guinea and rural Bangladesh aren't as well represented in the database. For most of their customers, that won't be an issue. That's not to say it's no issue at all, but it's not as big of an issue as CV is making it out to be. Gonna talk a lot about geographically variant genes, but the idea is this, if you look at each gene an individual has, and where it's most common, and you overlay all of those maps onto each other, you can get a decent sense of where someone's ancestors are from, well that's the theory anyways, but humans don't really work like that, we fight wars, and colonize, we sail, and explore, wherever we go we bring sex and germs with us that change genetic maps over time. The average white American is 98.6% white. This idea that distinct human groups will inevitably intermix if in proximity to each other does not stand up to scrutiny. Even full-scale invasions from foreign populations like the Mongols have not left an enormous impact on European genomes. Except perhaps in Finland, which is separated from Mongolia by only one country. The next several minutes of CV's video are spent talking about Kristen Brown's article in Gizmodo, how DNA testing botched my family's heritage and probably yours too. I'm going to try to focus on the major points CV puts forward regarding this article. Before I do that, I'm going to highlight a grossly inaccurate statement from Kristen Brown, the author in question. You may have heard the claim that humans are 99.9% .9 the same. That's from a study from 2000 by Craig Venter. Venter did a follow-up study finding that we are in fact only 99.5% the same genetically. The article CV is referencing repeats the same incorrect platitude that humans are 99.9% .9 the same, but she can't even state that correctly. She says that we are 99.99% .99 the same. She stated we are 50 times less genetically different than we are on average. By the way, humans and chimps are 98.7% the same. One of the criticisms presented is different labels. The first company she used, Ancestry, tends to use modern nation-state labels in some places, like Great Britain, but broader labels for others, like the Middle East or Caucasus. National Geographic uses a mix of ethnic and geographic regions, like Asia Minor or the Jewish diaspora. 23M does a mix of both, including continental regions, like Europe, and then breaking them down like Italy or Scandinavia. These tests are designed by the services to best match your genotype to that of living populations in those regions today. Is the result less valid if it states that your ancestors are from Spain and Portugal instead of southwestern Europe? No, this shows no real flaws with the tests themselves.
Now, accounting for all of these different categorizations, the variance between each test was still substantial. 23 and told Brown she was 3% Scandinavian. Ancestry said 32%. Chinkov said 8% of her genes derived from the Indian subcontinent, but 23 and said she had no South Asian DNA whatsoever. National Geographic showed a big chunk of Middle Eastern DNA, 16% from Asia Minor, 6% from the Persian Gulf, and 9% from the Jewish diaspora. Ancestry said she was only 5.5% Middle Eastern, and a whopping 62.6% .6 Northwestern European, but no Eastern European at all. The way CV framed this information is inaccurate. CV said, quote, 23andMe told Brown she was 3% Scandinavian, Ancestry said 32%, unquote. CV seems to be implying that 23andMe put the upper limit on Brown's Scandinavian ancestry at 3.1%. 23andMe actually said Brown was 41.9% broadly Northwestern European, 3.1% Scandinavian, and 62.6% .6 Northwestern European as a whole. Where did all the Scandinavian go? It's in broadly Northwestern European. 23andMe was really saying that we know Browns is at least 3.1% Scandinavian, but we can't nail down the remaining 41.9% between Scandinavia, the British Isles, and the rest of Northwestern Europe. But I won't deny there was some significant variation in Kristen Brown's results, which is not that significant given that we are dealing with a sample size of one. This is an anecdote, not evidence. We also don't know for a fact that Kristen Brown did not send in a different family member's spit in her place for different services and claim that her, it was her own. I'm willing to assume she was honest, in which case, again, this is still a sample size of one. I'm not sure CV would accept any proof against something he believes based on a sample size of one. Now let's hear more of what CV has to say. Population genetics is about comparisons, and so depending on whose genes are in the database, your results are going to compare differently. And two, because these genetic databanks are not archaeological excavations, they're genes from people who are currently alive. Ancestry tests don't tell you where your ancestors are from. They tell you where people who share your genes live now. So what? Ancestry testing services don't have a time machine to sequence the genomes of Renaissance period Europeans. But I can still trust that if I'm related to modern-day Irishmen, that I'm also related to their ancestors who lived in Ireland 500 years ago. CV's point is technically correct, but it's of little consequence in most cases. Number three, because people vary a lot more within groups than between them, the classic statistic that 85% of genetic variation exists within populations and only 15% exists between them. But because of the smaller amount of variance between groups, having a smaller number of samples from a given region makes it dramatically less likely you'll match with someone, even if 100% of your ancestors are from there. There's that statistic you'll recall from the review of Lewinton's fallacy, and you should remember why the claim about variation within versus between is a lot more impressive for race deniers until you compare the FST values in other species. But it is correct that if only a few individuals are sampled for a geographic region, that you are less likely to be recognized as having SNPs deemed to have an association with that region. That is not an argument that the tests are inherently flawed, but that they could be improved. So inevitably if people were evenly tested, if you tested every one sampling equally across all regions, you'd probably just find that you live exactly where you said you did, and the people who are in your nation, people of any given race, are probably a lot more similar to you based on these tests than people from somewhere else, even of your own race. This claim is spectacularly wrong. The whole point of an FST value above zero means that you are more likely to be similar of someone of your own race than of someone from a different race. This clearly shows that, again, CV has no understanding of what FST values are or what they mean. Now we are into the second main portion of CV's video, addressing the clusteredness of human races. Race scientists assert that you can separate people into races based on their genes using haplogroups or genetic population groups of people who share a common ancestor. It's interesting to note that CV uses the term race scientist instead of biologist, because Noah Rosenberg, whose study CV spends so much time criticizing, does not identify as a race scientist. This is a shitty rhetorical tactic, and yes, I will take the time to point it out. One of the most commonly cited pieces of research for this is Rosenberg and Pritchard's 2002 article, The Genetic Structure of Human Populations. If you've ever seen this graph before, that's the article it comes from. It's also the most widely cited paper in his field for the year that it was published. Rosenberg's team used a highly sophisticated clustering algorithm called Structure to detect clusters of genetic similarity in unidentified DNA samples from just over 1,000 individuals in 52 
populations they measured 377 microsatellite loci which are short non-coding DNA sequences. By non-coding I mean that they are not converted into proteins or other physical features inside your body. CV was accurate up to this point, but I will nitpick again. Microsatellites are not exclusively non-coding, but generally when they are coding, that's not a good thing. Most of our DNA is junk DNA, or DNA that doesn't do anything itself, but acts as a buffer for the genes that are important. Small correction, but it is not accurate to say that junk DNA doesn't do anything. Non-coding DNA can regulate how coding DNA is expressed. And it's better not to talk about things if you're going to use inaccurate oversimplifications. These microsatellite loci, because they don't impact, for example, the shape of your lungs, or anything terribly important, mutate much more frequently, and have an unusually high level of diversity that isn't typical in human DNA. As a side note, humans are an incredibly non-diverse species, emperor penguins, who I think pretty much all look exactly the same, have four times the genetic diversity that humans do. Heterozygosity is synonymous with genetic variability. And presumably, that's what CV is referring to with a statement about genetic diversity. The maximum value for heterozygosity is 1, if you'll recall from part 2 of my case for the existence of race. So it's impossible for any species to be even twice as genetically variable as humans, with our heterozygosity value well above 0.5, let alone 4 times as variable. I'd be surprised to see any source for this claim. Regardless, this is a teachable moment. The scope of genetic differences is not an absolute measure of the degree of phenotypic differences. Recall that phenotype is just everything we can observe about you, whereas genotype is a sequence of nucleotides that controls the proteins that are produced in your body. If Bob, Bill, and Joe are genetically identical, except Bill differs from Bob on one allele, and Joe differs from Bob on two different alleles, is the phenotypic difference between Bob and Joe twice as big as the difference between Bob and Bill? No, the two alleles Bob and Joe differ on might be non-coding, whereas even a single nucleotide polymorphism difference between Bob and Bill might result in one being mentally retarded, but not the other. Rosenberg found between 93% and 95% of all genetic variation between those thousand individuals were within the population groups they were sorted to. In other words, most genetic variation is everywhere, you're way more likely to have genes in common with someone in a different race on average than any given individual of your own race. This is objectively untrue. Consider Witherspoon 2007. The answer to the question, how often is a pair of individuals from one population genetically more dissimilar than two individuals chosen from two different populations, depends on the number of polymorphisms used to define that dissimilarity and the populations being compared. If genetic similarity is measured over many thousands of loci, the answer becomes never when individuals are sampled from geographically separated populations. Which I know sounds counterintuitive, but it makes sense. Humans aren't easily grouped into five or six groups, and so you have to ignore the bulk of genetic variation between individuals in order to sort them that way. But an algorithm does what it's programmed to do, and in this case it was not designed to show how variant the human species is. It was designed to sort people into groups based on the 5-7% to of genetic variance that occurs between them. Now, to be fair, 5-7% to is a lot of genes, even if the use of microsatellite loci artificially inflates the differences between people. Even a 1% variation in genes can be important depending on what genes and how they vary. This sentence is wrong in a variety of ways. Yes, cluster analyses aren't designed to measure genetic variability or genetic distance. But when scientists do measure human heterozygosity or genetic distance, we have values similar to other animals with recognized subspecies. CV is criticizing a cluster analysis for not being more things than it needs to be. It's designed to show you how human groups cluster into similar groups. It's not designed to tell you the FSD distances between those groups or to tell you the genetic variability within subgroups. The fact that a cluster analysis doesn't do things it wasn't designed to do is not a valid criticism. Then CV claims that only 5 to 7% of variation occurs between groups, and this is basically Lewontin's fallacy repeated, but with a different value assigned to variation between groups. CV vacillates between saying 15% or 5 to 7% of variation occurs between human groups, without any acknowledgement of the fact that he has stated contradictory figures. Then CV claims that only 5-7% to of variation occurs between groups, and this is basically Lewontin's fallacy repeated, but with a different value assigned to variation between groups. CV vacillates between saying 15% or 5-7% to of variation occurs between human groups, without any acknowledgement of the fact that he has stated contradictory figures.
Rosenberg, 2002, looked at 377 microsatellite lo loci from 1,056 individuals, which concluded that approximately 5% of variation occurs between groups. Elhaik, 2012, looked at 1 to 3 million SNPs from 602 samples of eight populations in order to determine that 12% of variation occurs between groups. Does this mean that Rosenberg, 2002, is useless? No, a study with a primary goal of measuring FST distances, looking over a much larger scope of the genome, is going to be a better measure of FST distance than a study which had the primary goal of demonstrating how different human populations clustered together genetically. CV's next quote picks up immediately from where we left off. This begs the question, when you do sort people into groups based on their differences, do they correspond to the supposedly obvious notions of race? Now, this is really dumb. Begging the question is a logical fallacy which is best understood as assuming the initial point which has yet to be proven. If I was arguing that participation in unions should not be mandatory, and I made the argument that people should not be forced to participate in unions because that would be bad if they were, that is begging the question. I'm assuming what I'm supposed to be true is already true, without presenting an actual argument for it. Consider the next equally stupid part of CV sentence. Do they clusters correspond to supposedly obvious notions of race? Supposedly obvious? CV is contradicting himself in an astoundingly stupid fashion. If you're going to imply that race is not obvious, you shouldn't repeatedly concede that race is obvious prior to that argument. Here are two quotes from CV where he affirms exactly what he is implying here is untrue. I won't read them off to you, but feel free to pause the video and read them for yourself. It goes without saying that if you ask a computer software to break people into five groups, it'll produce five groups. But are those groups races? Let's look at what Rosenberg's data reveals. When the computer was asked to sort people into two, three, four, or five groups, this is what it produced. I'll interject to note that the software was not told where individuals came from. It was only given the information from the microsatellites considered, and it sorted people based on the similarity of their microsatellite loci alone. And the information about which clusters correlated to which geographical region was added after the software had finished clustering these populations. Here you can see their findings that to some extent, the clusters seem to fit within predefined populations. It was more likely to group people together who came from countries that are next to each other than countries that are across the world from each other. You'll note at the top the continent of origin corresponding to each population group, and at the bottom their country of origin. Now, as I mentioned, structure is a program designed to sort information into the number of groups the user selected. Rosenberg also tested 7 to 20 populations, but he didn't put them in his paper. Because structure identified multiple ways to divide the sampled individuals when the number was larger than 6. So if you go for 6, the number heralded in the paper. As the main finding, even a powerful algorithm can't split humans into seven, eight, or nine groups. It starts returning multiple possible configurations because we're all too genetically similar. Even though it's supposed to be a program that identifies the single best match, perhaps because of this, Rosenberg says that his paper is not meant to be interpreted as scientific race. For the next few minutes, I'm going to have to rely on some diagrams. If you're just listening, you're going to want to start watching. CV emphasizes the phenomenon that Rosenberg calls multimodality. This is when the same software presents different clustering solutions for the same raw data. The software performs multiple, sometimes hundreds or thousands of runs of the same data so that researchers can be sure that the results are consistent. According to Jacobson and Rosenberg, 2007, there are two kinds of multimodality, label switching and genuine multimodality. What you are looking at is a cluster analysis of 600 chickens of various breed from Rosenberg 2001. The results on the right have been interpreted by Klump. Technically, the actual results on the left and right are the same, but the result on the left is a victim of label switching. The multimodality that exists on the left is obscured by label switching. Now I'm going to quote Rosenberg's discussion about how to deal with genuine multimodality. Emphasis added by me. Interpreting the results of multiple population genetic cluster analyses is not always straightforward. One could argue that the single replicate with the highest likelihood, according to the criterion of the clustering program, is the optimal clustering solution, and that solutions with lower likelihood can be discarded. However, for complex datasets that produce several distinct solutions with similar likelihoods, this strategy may not be satisfactory, as it disregards both the uncertainties of the analysis and important population structure information that may only be visible in different modes. From a Bayesian perspective, 
A possible approach would be to, to weight different solutions by their likelihoods. However, this approach can be difficult to apply with individual membership coefficients in the case of genuine multimodality. A third approach is to summarize data on the outcomes of many replicates, such as in Table 2 of Rosenberg et al. 2001. Regardless of the choice of procedure for employing multiple cluster analyses to make biological interpretations from population genetic data, Clump can provide a useful way of assessing the similarity of the outcomes of individual runs. CV simply ignores all of these approaches for dealing with multimodality, and confidently claims that it is impossible to accurately cluster humans into more than six groups at a global level, because the remaining genetic difference is, well, too small. Unfortunately for him, Tishkoff 2009 completed a structure analysis of a global dataset with 1,327 markers genotyped in 3,945 individuals. So we're talking roughly four times as many markers and four times as many individuals sampled in Rosenberg's 2002 analysis. This analysis successfully divided Africans alone into 14 clusters, and then they clustered global populations into 14 clusters as well. Here is the structure analysis in Africa only. Here is the global cluster analysis clustered between 9 and 14 groups. Here is an expanded view of the global populations clustered into 14 groups. CV never even addresses Rosenberg's methods for dealing with multimodality, so I'm not going to pretend that he has an intelligent response. I think it's pretty obvious that the kind of genuine multimodality we see in Rosenberg's 2001 analysis of chickens is not so significant that the majority of results about clustering chickens into their respective breeds should be discarded. As far as the remaining genetic differences being too small to measure, CV is simply talking out of his ass. We can measure genetic distances between even very closely related groups. 0.350% of variation occurs between Igbo and Braun as opposed to within those populations as a whole. That's a much smaller genetic distance than seen within humanity as a whole, and roughly 100 times smaller than the genetic distance measured between Australian Aboriginals and African Bantus, where 33% of variation occurs between instead of within those populations. Here's the really important point. Genuine multimodality can occur in cluster analyses of other species which are divided into breeds or subspecies, as we saw with Rosenberg 2001. Is this presented by biologists it, with regards to other animals as a reason to discard distinctions below the species level? No, it's not. This is a form of tactical skepticism that is only applied to humans. This is not a truth-oriented perspective. This is CV's anti-white ideology. If innate group differences can ex explain discrepancies in life outcome, then how will he ever be able to guilt white people into surrendering our countries to foreigners who hate us and envy our prosperity? I'm going to skip ahead in CV's discussion of Structure's results. It's helpful to keep this in mind, because as Rosenberg asked the computer to sort people into more and more groups, the color coding only shows you the groups that can be formed. It doesn't tell you anything about the distance between those groups. Here's a graph from Rosenberg 2005 that displays the relationship between geographic distance and genetic distance between groups. I know it's hard to believe, but different graphs exist to display different kinds of information. A diagram of human clusters is not invalid or flawed because it doesn't show the same information as different graphs. Continuing to quote from CV, I'll put the graph he's referencing on the screen. For example, when you jump from five groups to six, structure isolates the Kalash, a somewhat isolated Indo-European group. According to the K value, the difference between group four, the blue group, and group five, the yellow group, is one. But one what? There isn't one standardized genetic difference between those groups. So groups four and the fifth of may be very genetically similar. Groups one and the sixth of may be very different. There's not really any way to tell. So when structure groups Africans, Middle Easterners, North Africans, and Europeans together in one situation, but then separately in another, it's not telling you how different those groups are. It's just telling you that if you force the computer to make a choice, given these 1,000 individuals, that's how it would separate them. CV, are you blind? Right above the diagram that you are referencing in Rosenberg's 2002 study is a table of genetic distances. Did you even look at the study? If you had spent less time doing your makeup and more time reading the study, you could have answered your own question. The decision to exclude the Kalash doesn't necessarily mean that the whole study is useless, but it does tell you that Rosenberg is making decisions that are influenced by popular ideas about how to divide populations. This is true of his decision to call those five geographic regions from K equals six the main finding of his study too. 
Put simply, there is no reason to select those groupings over two or three, except that they just so happen to correspond more closely to our colloquial notions of race, even more closely than when you ask structure to just divide people into five groups. There are non-arbitrary reasons to divide humans into five to seven broad racial groups instead of two or three or 50. Why choose five to seven instead of two or three? Because the overhead of using five terms instead of three is not that significant, it's not a barrier to human understanding, but you aren't clumping together extremely divergent populations into only a few categories. Using five to seven groups instead of two to three provides significantly greater precision with little inconvenience in the burden of vocabulary. Using 50 categories would indeed be more precise, but it would not be nearly as convenient. So yes, there is a reason to choose five to seven groups. It's not purely arbitrary. Continuing to quote, emphasis added. And, to be honest, they are not very good approximations at K equals 6, people from Russia, Italy, Palestine, and Pakistan all cluster together. Groups that previously grouped together, like the Kalash and Africa's Bantu population in Kenya, suddenly have nothing in common at all. You can see here at K equals 2 the Maya people have a partial clustering with the Africa, Europe, Middle East, North Africa subgroup. But at K equals 4 they have nothing in common with the African subgroup, but now suddenly show genes from Africa and East Asia. You didn't even state your claim correctly. At k equals 2, the Maya have a partial cluster with the Africa, Europe, Middle East, and Central slash South Asia cluster. But that's not remotely as significant of an error as a sloppiness and accuracy of the rest of your comment here. When the number of clusters changes and the groups are then sorted into different clusters, there is no basis for interpreting this as those new clusters having nothing in common at all with the previous ones. That statement indicates that you have no idea what you're talking about. These cluster analyses are not trying to directly tell you the exact degree of genetic distance between any two subgroups. That's why they have a separate table. None of these things tell us more than any other grouping, because there is no standardized unit of difference between the groups or between the k-levels. That's why a single tiny population can be pulled out when you jump an entire k-value. Structure is not designed to have a standardized unit of genetic distance, which is why Rosenberg included that handy table for reference. You know, that table that you've ignored consistently. The first thing to remember is that the sample size for this study is a mere 1,056 people. I'm no statistician, but CV clearly doesn't know anything about sample size if he thinks that a sample of a little over 1,000 people is going to have a particularly large margin of error. Other researchers who had nothing to do with Rosenberg studies independently determined that a sample size of less than 300 is sufficient and only marginal gains are made in accuracy with each increase in sample size. And this was about haplotyping for the project called HapMap. It's much more plausible that not even distributing the populations being tested artificially skewed those results. Not only did Rosenberg's 2005 follow-up study look at a larger number of genetic markers, up to 993 from the previous 337, they also used a more geographically diverse sample. Rosenberg made a special effort to use a more geographically diverse sample precisely to address this criticism that CV did not come up with independently. Here's what Rosenberg had to say on this subject. Holding all other variables constant, geographic dispersion had a relatively modest effect on clusteredness, with a considerably smaller R2 than number of loci, sample size, or number of clusters meaning it was the least significant factor compared to anything else. Additionally, geographic dispersion was generally less consistent in the direction which it affected clusteredness, although in contrast to what was expected, samples that were less geographically random produced lower clusteredness more often than they produced higher clusteredness. So unevenly distributed populations were more likely to bias the samples in the opposite direction that CV claimed it would, and it was expected by the researchers that it would. So, CV was completely wrong, again. The differences between us are mostly made up by the genes that make small adjustments, like changing the shape of the antigens on your cells, or adapting the shape of your nose. These are small adjustments that are located in genes that are made to mutate rapidly to give humans an evolutionary advantage. More complex features of humans, like our intelligence, our fine motor skills, and the incredible capacity we have for imagination, trickiness, resilience, creativity, involve thousands of genes that play a much more critical roles in the body, and, as a result, evolve much slower slower. CV doesn't cite a single source for this, I'll mention again. Height is a highly heritable trait, and is a highly polygenic trait. Presumably, no one would deny that genes are a major causal component of existing racial gaps in height. We know that Asians in the U.S. are not represented in the NBA 
by the proportion of, of their population, in large part because there aren't as many particularly tall Asian men as there are of other races, proportionally. The fact that height is a highly polygenic trait did not preclude pygmies from diverging massively from other human groups in this critical trait over a relatively short time span evolutionarily. Pygmies also have an average IQ below 60. If they could diverge in the frequency of genes for a critical and polygenic trait like height, the same is true of intelligence or brain size. Evolutionary biologists say those features were set about 200,000 years ago, far earlier than the first modern human migration out of Africa. CV keeps finding new and inventive ways to be incorrect. As I've previously cited, though not discussed, a recent human job on discovery in Israel is approximately 180,000 years old, and of course Israel is not in Africa. Recent Homo sapiens fossils in Morocco pushed back the evolution of humans to around 315,000 years ago. So CV is using old numbers, and on top of that, he asserts that traits like intelligence were set, which is not how evolution via natural selection ever functions. Evolutionary pressures are going to be wildly different in a central African jungle, a river valley in East Asia, or in a boreal forest in Northern Europe. And there is no reason to assume that the selection pressure for any trait, be it height, intelligence, or anything, would be completely uniform across those vastly differing environments. There is no reason to assume that the frequency with which relatively intelligent people had surviving offspring in different environments would be uniform. Inevitably, geographically distant populations have diverged in traits, and even and in fact especially in important traits like intelligence. Continuing to quote. Now some race scientists will call this the continuum fallacy. Just because there is a complicated middle ground doesn't mean there aren't pure races, just that there are also mixed race regions who have what they call admixtures or mixes of genes from different regions. But in order to believe that you have to already assume that there is such a thing as pure races. If I say now, some race deniers will call this the ad hominem fallacy. That's not true, but here's my argument. CV is wrong because he is ugly. The issue with that statement is that I did not make it less fallacious by acknowledging that people would call it out as being fallacious. And this is analogous to what CV is trying to do. CV is attempting to say that human variation is continuous, and he hasn't even proven that, and because it's continuous, there's no reason to make distinctions at any point along the way. This is the continuum fallacy, and it's attempting to somehow preempt that response by acknowledging that it is the continuum fallacy. We make distinctions between rich and poor, puddles and lakes, between yellow and red, even if there is continuous variation between two sections. That does not imply that there are no relevant distinctions to be made. This all begs an important question. How do population geneticists choose which populations they represent in their gene banks? Because it's hard to know how the small sample size impacted Rosenberg's results. Another improper use of the term question begging. <laughs> you stupid son of a bitch! <laughs> the first thing to remember is that the sample size for this study is a mere 1,056 people. Because it's hard to know how the small sample size impacted Rosenberg's results. But if you picked a different thousand people, it would probably look different. But if you picked a different thousand people, it would probably look different. You know, I'm something of a retarded dumb motherfucker myself. And so the ability to form groups by saying something like, well, yes, it's true that Italians and North Africans group together, but just because there's a middle ground doesn't mean there's not purity assumes that the people who live in the center of either of those continents represent some kind of purity. That's no more accurate than saying that Chinese people are an admixture between the pure Mongolians and the pure Japanese, just picking two places that are next to each other and deciding they constitute the pure races, and that the middle ground just complicates the picture isn't science, it's a political determination that people are making in advance. No. The decision not to group people into categories when it is extremely easy to do so based on a second's glance at their features because you don't like the social consequences is a political determination. CV doesn't care about science and is only interested in imposing his bizarre views on taxonomy and biology because of his political ideology. Clearly, we can separate people into racial groups based on their genes. The question is to what degree are racial differences like in intelligence a consequence of genetic differences? This tactical skepticism about whether or not we can even categorize humans into races is annoying, and even creationists engage in less motivated reasoning than race deniers like CV do.
CB likes to pretend that he's only disagreeing with the racist, but the fact of the matter is that the term admixture is regularly used to refer to interbreeding between subgroups among animals besides humans. The idea that this suddenly becomes unscientific when applied to humans is again purely ideological. Whether or not populations have been historically isolated for tens of thousands of years is not determined by your political preferences. The decision to ignore the human biodiversity produced by hugely differing selection pressures across the globe is not the view of an unbiased observer. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about CV's discussion about the medical use of race, given how long this video is already going to be. I'll summarize as best I can. CV correctly states that almost no disease is completely unique to one group, even if they are by far the most common amongst a single group. You can't refrain from testing Turks and Indians who might have sickle cell anemia just because it's most common among Africans. But no advocate of using race in science would suggest using race as a sole method of predicting an outcome. Associating a condition with a race can still give doctors more information about the probability that an individual has a given condition. CV says that you can find bone marrow donors outside of your race, even if finding them within your own race is more common. True, but race is still a factor. If you have to do a donor drive to save a Chinese child's life, and you don't go out of your way to set up the drive in a majority Asian area, you are endangering a child's life just because you don't want to seem racist. This is such a mainstream and non-controversial fact that I'm not going to waste any more of my time talking about it. That's it for this video. CV's next video is going to be about heritable traits and IQ scores. So I look forward to an equally dishonest and inaccurate presentation of the research. The big question is if CV will repackage the same old nonsense or try to be original and in the process make an even bigger fool of himself.